Hi everyone, welcome back. This is basic plant science lecture number five. Let me share the PowerPoint slides. Okay, good. And make it big. Make it nice and big and I'll make myself bigger as well. That's good. Cool. All right. Yep. So no, lecture number five, we are over halfway. Once we finish today, we'll be over halfway through the material for this semester. So summer has moved really, really fast. Hope you guys are um, staying up with it. I hope you're doing the homework assignment quizzes, right? And turning those in on time. So make sure you've been doing that. Um, yeah. If you have any questions, as always, you feel free to email me here. So last class, we did flowers, fruits, and seeds, right? We talked about the structure of flowers, the differences of monocots and dicot flowers and seeds, and also an overview of the differences in monocots and dicots in general, kinds of fruits, fruit and seed dispersal, seed structure, and germination. Today, we're going to talk about physiology. So this is going to be a little bit more of a science-y lecture than maybe some of the other ones. Or you might be thinking they're all sciencey. I don't know why she keeps saying that, <laughs> but we have the word physiology, right? So that there's an ology, so that automatically has a more science vibe to it. Uh, we're going to talk about water movement and transpiration, photosynthesis and respiration, plant hormones and their interactions, and then lastly, plant movement. And the good news, so it is a little bit more sciencey, but the good news is is that some of this stuff we've already covered briefly. Uh, in particular, water movement and transpiration, we've covered a decent amount. Uh, and we've also talked a little bit about photosynthesis. So, so some of, not all of this will be brand new today. All right, so what is plant physiology? Uh, and as always, if my head is blocking any part of the slide, you could always feel free to pull. The slides are available on their own on Canvas. Um, but what this says at the top is, it's the study of metabolic, processes in plants, in plants. So what are these metabolic processes? There are a lot of them. And what they all do is they allow a plant to live and survive uh, in its environment. So this includes a uh, water economy. So acquiring water and using a certain amount of water, depending on how much you're able to acquire, mineral nutrition, growth and development, photosynthesis, responding to the environment, transport, and way more things than we have to get into, have time to get into in a shortened semester. But there's even more things that happen um, as processes within these plants. Let's talk first about water movement and transpiration. Like I said, some of this is gonna be a bit of a review. We should already know what transpiration is by this point. We've talked about transpiration quite a bit in the other lectures, including the leaf lecture. I think we maybe even talked about it during the root lecture, which that's the same class. So we definitely did. And we may have even talked about it briefly in the STEM lecture. So we already know what that is, but basically if you, if you forgot, transpiration is the process by which water vapor is released from the leaves. Where are they released from in the leaves? these holes that are guarded by cells that are aptly named guard cells called a stomatal apparatus. And so water is absorbed at the root, water travels through the stem, water gets to the leaf, and then water vapor leaves through the leaf. And as I've mentioned before, that almost acts kind of like a straw. By the water leaving out of the leaf, it kind of pulls all the other water water molecules with it. And therefore the water that is being absorbed at the roots and entering the stem can reach very great heights in plants, like even a hundred foot tall tree, because the transpiration process allows the water to overcome the forces of gravity, right? That would have otherwise hold it down. And we saw this before as well. This is a little thing you could try at home, right? By covering a, a leaf or part of a plant in a plastic bag to see it gather water vapor. This is, I think, a 
uh, newish slide. No, we saw this slide as well too. This is just a, right, it says recall at the top. That's how I know. Um, right, so this is where that water vapor is escaping from the leaf via the hole in the stomatal apparatus. So this over here is a, um, this is one stomatal apparatus that's inside of, uh, that's on the epidermis, the lower epidermis of a, a leaf. There's a hole that's called a stoma, uh, a stoma rather. And each hole is guarded by two cells called guard cells. And those guard cells will swell and uh, open and close as they swell and get relaxed. And that will allow the hole to be open or not and allow water vapor to leave or not, right? This is the same thing, just showing you a cross section uh, where the hole of the stoma is a little bit more uh, obvious. So this is a recall as well. This is a microscope slide showing you one, two, three, four stomatal apparatuses, right? Each of them have guard cells and each of them have one stoma. You don't need to know about subsidiary cells. So don't worry about that. Um, this is another same kind of idea so that you could actually see these are microscope slides on the top of an open stoma and a closed stoma. And basically the way that the stoma, uh, the guard cells open and close is you don't need to know all of the physiology involved, but basically um, some ions, which are charged particles are going to go into these cells. In this case, it's potassium ions, which is K. And <clears throat> When this happens, that's going to attract water to going in there as well, see, and water follows. And when water enters the guard cells, it causes the guard cells, think about a water balloon, right? If you add a lot of water to a water balloon, the water balloon gets really like taut, right? Like it gets, there's pressure from that water, right? And in the case of the guard cells, when the water causes that pressure, it makes them uh, get so full of water that it forces them open, that it forces them open. And thus the stoma will be open. On the other hand, um, if these charged particles, these ions leaves the guard cells, water will also leave the guard cells and the result will be the guard cells will fall closed and the stoma will be closed and thus no water vapor will be able to be released. So there's a couple things happening here in terms of water. I don't want you to get confused. One thing that's happening is that if a stoma is open, right, water vapor is leaving. And if a stoma is closed, as shown here on the right, water vapor is not leaving. The other thing that's happening here is the regulation of opening and closing that stoma. If water goes into the guard cells, the stoma will be open and water vapor can leave. If water leaves the guard cells, guard cells will fall closed and water won't be able to leave anymore. Um, we're all talking about water movement and transpiration, right? So water movement and transpiration. This is also a recall slide talking about root hairs. The top, it says root hairs expand the surface area of the root assessing more soil. And so we already talked about that in the root lecture. Root hairs are part of the epidermis. Root hairs are going to be what actually absorbs water from the soil. So on the left here, we saw this slide before as well. You see the um, primary root, what, what was the radical, now the primary root emerging from the seed. And it's covered in all these little fuzzies, right? All these fuzzies, which are root hairs. If we were to look closer at that and look at the epidermis of that root, here's an epidermal cell. 
And this is also an epidermal cell next to it that happens to be growing a root hair. And as I talked about in the root lab, this bottom one, right, this one here, it can have a lot more surface area than this one here, meaning it can be exposed to more soil than the one on top and thus exposed to more water than the one on top and thus the root hair is where the water will be absorbed. This is also a recall slide. Yeah, and so this is putting it all together again, water entering at those root hairs, water moving up through what tissue system? through the vascular tissue system and specifically through the xylem tissue, which is what conducts water in the plant. So water absorbed at the root hair, right? Here we go, water being absorbed at the root hair, water traveling up the stem through the xylem, water entering the leaf, in this case through the midrib or the central vein of that leaf, uh, and then going through the other littler veins out to the other parts of the leaf where some of that water will be used to do photosynthesis, which we'll talk about in a second, but some of that water won't be used for photosynthesis and um, be released through those stomatal apparatuses um, as water vapor, right? Thus pulling all the water through the whole plant. Okay, so now we're gonna watch a little video of this. It's not too long. Oh, I should though. I gotta stop sharing because I need to share with sound, which is something I learned. Share with sound. Okay. Um, I don't think it'll be too loud, but just as a just to be on the safe side, you know, put my volumes at right now. I'm gonna turn it down. These videos are also available on Canvas. If you open the PowerPoint slides of this lecture, which is lecture five, in the replies underneath that lecture are the links to each of these MP4s that you could watch there in case the sound is messed up. But let's give it a try. So I think I just gotta go forward. In order for a tree to carry out photosynthesis and maintain its over- Oh. Overall health. Water and hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's 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 go. Let's try that again. Sorry about that. In order for a tree to carry out photosynthesis and maintain its overall. Oh, that's very annoying. All right. Well, I guess I have to keep my video open. That's fine. <laughs> I was trying to close the video so I wouldn't be so distracting. We'll go that one more one more time again. Overall health. Sorry. In order for a tree to carry out photosynthesis and maintain its overall health, water and nutrients need to move throughout the entire tree, even against gravity. How does a plant manage this without an organ like a heart that pumps fluids? As we will see, water is pulled from the roots to the leaves through a process called transpiration. In addition, water potential drives the movement of water from one area of the plant to another, using osmosis, gravity, and the surface tension of water. Transpiration begins in the leaves. Okay. We already, actually the other way around, we already have learned about transpiration. So maybe I should have put that video earlier. <laughs> um, this is a, that thing I was talking to you before about water economy. Um, what do I want you guys to pull? So, yeah, some of this gets a little bit more complicated than you guys need to know for this class. I guess the main thing that I want you to pull from this is you should know what the process of transpiration is. You should know what the players are, right? For example, the stomatal apparatus, you should know what that is. Um, but then you should also know that there's there's these other parts involved, right? Which I've already gone through many times, but just to, so we're all on the same page, right? You need to know that water is brought in by the root and absorbed by the root hair. And I've mentioned many times about how water is almost like 
it's not a magnet, but it's kind of like a magnet in that water molecules, when they're next to one another, because of the charges involved on a water molecule, water molecules kind of want to be near one another, one another. And so that's what this here is showing you guys. It's like these little dashed lines in between these water molecules are trying to show you that they, they want to pull each other. And that is a process called cohesion and adhesion. All that, all that is meaning is that the water molecules want to be together. And so when one starts to move, it'll pull the other ones with it. Showing that here in this string of water molecules. Notice that these, like I said, are going up through the xylem cells. Um, and then ultimately in the leaf, right up here in the leaf, let me move this box if I can. Yeah. Up here in the leaf, they are coming through xylem of the leaf and then ultimately kind of moving through those mesophyll cells. Some of them are gonna be used for photosynthesis um, and ultimately getting released back into the atmosphere. Um, yeah, you don't know, you do not need to know the water potential gradient thing that's on the left side of this slide. Okay. All right, so that, like I said, most of that is review because we've covered water quite a bit in this class. So now we'll talk photosynthesis and respiration. Some of this will also be review. All right, so no, we're not gonna learn about horses. <laughs> don't get too excited. <laughs> this is an image from your book which it took me a minute to kind of figure out why we have horses, but it's okay. I figured it out. So this, this slide is trying to show you guys how photosynthesis, although it's a process that occurs in plants, that process is ridiculously important to all living things, pretty much all living things on earth. And in this case, a horse, <laughs> but us as well, us as well. So we know the basic blueprint of photosynthesis already because we've talked about it. Uh, but just to remind you, right, you have a sun, we have the sun. The sun shines on the earth. The rays of light from the sun have energy in them. And plants are able to absorb carbon dioxide and water from the environment and use the power of the sun to do a process called photosynthesis. When photosynthesis is done, the plants will have made sugars, uh, mostly glucose, for example, other things like starch and other carbohydrates, and as a waste product is oxygen. And how that benefits the horse, right, or us as well, is that the horse is gonna breathe in the oxygen, right? We breathe oxygen, so that part we need. However, the horse is also going to eat the plants that contain these sugars and get nutrition. And because the horse is breathing in oxygen and eating nutrition from the plants, the horse is going, the cells inside of the horse are going to be able to make energy to allow the horse to run, right? Or walk or sleep or have its heart beat, right? Though all those processes require energy. And so plants provide energy to us via their food that they make for themselves, the sugar that we then get when we eat them and via the oxygen we receive that we breathe that they release as a byproduct of their process of photosynthesis. And so plants are doing photosynthesis. So when we talk about photosynthesis, we're talking about a process occurring in plants, but respiration happens in almost all living organisms um, that breathe. Up. So if, it, if an organism, yeah. For the purposes of, this, of for the purposes of this class, for all organisms, for all organisms, respiration occurs in all organisms because all organisms need energy to have things occur, right? Energy to grow, energy to move, energy to digest food, etc. 
And so that's happening inside of this horse, for example, but it's also happening inside of plants. Plants also do respiration. Uh, so now we'll watch this little video. In order for plants to grow, they need inputs of carbon dioxide, water, and energy. The chemical process by which plants use these resources to manufacture glucose, the building blocks of plants, is called photosynthesis. In the process, oxygen gas is produced as a byproduct. The energy for photosynthesis originates in the sun and arrives at the earth as sunlight. This light has both a wave and a particle nature. The particles, or photons, are the smallest units of light. Photons oscillate along a path, which is measured as wavelengths. The light emitted from the sun contains photons in a wide spectrum of wavelengths, called the electromagnetic spectrum. Photosynthetic organisms use only a small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum, called visible light. Photosynthetic organisms contain pigments that facilitate the capture of wavelengths of light in the visible light range. The color of the pigment comes from the wavelengths of light reflected. Plants appear green because they reflect yellow and green wavelengths of light. Red and blue wavelengths of light are absorbed by these pigments and provide the energy that is used for photosynthesis. Okay. Yeah, so maybe you didn't know that. Maybe maybe this may be a new thing for you to know. Um, yeah, so when we see something as a certain color, it's actually because that's the color of, so as they said, there's all these different colors in the sunlight, right? Sunlight's made of many different colors, some of which we can see with our eyes, some of which we can't, for example, like um, uh, ultraviolet light. Like you, we can't see ultraviolet light. It is there, but we can't see it. But back to the colors thing. Yeah, so like leaves, for example, to us appear green because leaves are absorbing the blue part of the sunlight and the red part of the sunlight, but they're not absorbing the green part of the sunlight or the yellowish part of the sunlight as well. And so that's why leaves appear green. Um, pretty cool to think about, yeah. I don't know if you've ever gotten like a little glass prism or something that they sell in stores that sometimes sell plants and wind chimes and things, but yeah, to, you can like hang it in your window and it makes rainbows on your wall, right? That's because it's breaking up that visible light in the sunlight. Uh, and enough about that. Oh so, yeah, photosynthesis, we've taught, we've seen this slide before, um, but we're gonna go a little bit more in detail today about photosynthesis, but Overall, what is photosynthesis? Well, it's when we take light energy from the sun, or not we, when plants, when plants take that light energy from the sun and turn it into chemical energy via a bunch of different processes, um, right? So that light energy is from the sunlight and then the chemical energy is, oh, oh, sorry. The sunlight or the light energy is going to transform, transform what? Transform carbon dioxide and water that the plant absorbed, right? So it absorbed carbon dioxide from the air and it absorbed water from the soil. And those are going to be transformed using light energy from the sun into chemical energy, which will be sugars. Sugars provide chemical, sugars are the chemical that can thus be used to make energy in living organisms. Uh, so where does this all occur? In leaves, in leaves, particularly in the mesophyll of the leaf. So we, during the leaf lecture, talked about the different parts of a leaf, and we may have even seen something similar to this in that, but photosynthesis is occurring in the mesophyll, in the meso, look here, mesophyll cell layer, so here's the upper epidermis, here's the lower epidermis. We know that that's the lower epidermis because we see the stomatal apparatuses in that layer. And all the stuff in the middle, except for the vein, except for the vein, all that other stuff is the mesophyll. There's the palisade mesophyll on the top, which I always remember because it's long and skinny, kind of like the rocks on the palisades. 
and the spongy mesophyll on the bottom because it's a little bit more uh, compact and kind of looks like almost spongy. So that's where photosynthesis is going to occur. And notice the stomatal apparatuses is also where CO2 gas is entering the leaf, right? Because this, we need CO2 gas, plants need the CO2 gas in order to make sugars. All right, um, so in this mesophyll layer up here, you notice it looks green. And the reason it looks green is because here's one mesophyll cell and it looks green. And the reason it looks green is because it's filled with these things called chloroplasts. Here's one chloroplast, here's another chloroplast, et cetera. This is one chloroplast that they've blown up big for you to be able to see. And inside of each chloroplast are these little stacks, green stacks. And those green stacks are called thylakoid, thylakoid. So each stack, or sorry, each, Um, yeah, sorry. Yes, each stack is made up of thylakoids. Sorry, let's back up. I messed that up. Thylakoid is one green thing. One green thing. And you know that because look, thylakoid space, there's each green thing it almost looks like an empty cookie or something, right? So each each disc, each green disc that you see in the stack is a thylakoid. One stack is called granum. And all of the grana, that's how you say it plural, but don't worry about that. All of these things are surrounded by a fluid that, it, that stays inside of the chloroplast and that fluid is called stroma. The reason I'm pointing all this out to you is because Part of photosynthesis is going to occur on the thylakoids, and part of photosynthesis is going to occur in the stroma. And that's why I'm showing you where these things are. Okay. So this is that chloroplast again. And, and chloroplasts are special cells that are called plastids. Uh, you don't need to know that for this course, it's okay. Um, and inside of each chloroplast, so inside of the, why don't you go back, inside of these, right, inside of the thylakoids, the thylakoids look green, right? And that's because the thylakoids have a green pigment <clears throat> in them. And that green pigment is chlorophyll. Pigment like a dye, right? Like a dye, um, like a pigment. So this is what this is trying to show you. So here's a leaf, there's a compound leaf on the left. Inside of the mesophyll layer of that compound leaf will be mesophyll cells. Inside of those mesophyll cells will be chloroplasts. Inside of those chloroplasts will be stacks of things called thylakoids. And the thylakoids are going to be surrounded by a fluid called stroma. And the thylakoids inside of the chloroplast contain a pigment called chlorophyll. And if you need to, you should pause and rewind these last 30 seconds to just make sure you know where, I'm go where I am and what I've said so far, right? About the mesophyll cells, what's inside of mesophyll cell, et cetera. Because um, it's important to understand that bef before we're going forward. All right, so this is a bunch of uh, chloroplasts. And inside of that, we can see the tops of some of those thylakoids. And the thylakoids are green because they have inside of them a pigment called chlorophyll. Um, yes, that's what I just said. So the chlorophyll pigment is inside of these 
thylakoids, which are the in the image here are the green stacks, the, the little green discs of that green, those green stacks. And the thylakoids are surrounded by a liquid called a stroma, right? That's, I already said all that. Okay, so back to photosynthesis. So we already know carbon dioxide and water are going to be absorbed by the plant. And then the plant's gonna use sunlight to do process. And the result of that process will be oxygen as a waste product and sugars. And just so you know, in case you don't know, CO2 is how you write carbon dioxide. H2O is how you write water. Water. So this carbon. So this is a CO2 is a molecule of carbon dioxide. H2O is a molecule of water. O2 is oxygen gas. And C6 H12 O6 is the um, molecular formula of glucose. Just so you know, because later uh, we'll, you'll see why there. So there's, as I mentioned, there's two stages of photosynthesis that you guys should know. One occurs in the thylakoid and one occurs in the stroma. The one that occurs in the thylakoid is called the thylakoid associated reactions. And the one that occurs in the stroma is called the stroma associated reactions. So in each stage, there's gonna be a series of reactions, chemical reactions that occur. Another name for the stroma associated reactions is the Calvin cycle. Okay, this is a nice little overview slide. It's also going to guide our understanding of photosynthesis for this lecture. So first stage, sunlight, first stage, the plant absorbs carbon dioxide from the air. And meanwhile, down in the roots, meanwhile, down in the roots, water is being absorbed, right? And so sunlight energy, oh yeah, oh, sorry, I already did it. Uh, oh, leaves absorb carbon dioxide, water, leaves absorb carbon dioxide, sunlight shines on the leaves. Water is absorbed at the roots, right? In the leaf cells, in the chloroplast, they're going to use the energy of the sunlight to break apart the water molecule. So the energy of the sunlight is going to split the H2O of water molecule into H and O, <laughs> right? So that's what this is showing you. You have H2O or water plus light from the sun. And what that's going to create is oxygen as a waste product and then a bunch of energy molecules. So you guys don't need to, you don't need to know this formula. There's a formula that you'll need to know at the end, but, but this formula might help you understand that formula at the end. Just know that ATP and NADPH, then NADHP, NH, those are just, chemical energy and reducing power. You don't need to know that. Just know that in the thylakoids, the energy from the sunlight is going to split water up into oxygen and then energy molecules. That's plenty for you to know for this part. So let's watch this real quick. Within eukaryotic photosynthetic organisms, also known as photoautotrophs, the chemical reactions of photosynthesis occur within plant cells in specialized structures known as chloroplasts. Photosynthesis consists of two sets of reactions, the light-dependent reactions and the Calvin cycle. Within the chloroplast are small disc-like structures called thylakoids, which are surrounded by a fluid-filled space called the stroma. The reactions that synthesize glucose, the Calvin cycle, occur in the stroma. The light-dependent reactions occur in the thylakoid. So just so you know, the light-dependent reactions 
are the thylakoid associated reactions. They're the same thing, just so you know. It is here that conversion of light energy to chemical energy is initiated. Okay, oops. Uh, Within, oh. with, okay. So that video finished as, at zooming into the membrane of the thylakoid, which we'll see again in a, in a video coming up. So here we go. I'll use black is good, right? So the plant absorbed water. The water's in the leaf now. Sunlight's shining on that. And that sunlight provides energy that allows the H2O to get split up into H and O. Don't worry about the numbers. And then these energy molecules. So that's what this is showing you here, right? This is a zoomed in to a leaf and to a uh, chloroplast. And so, yeah, that's what this is showing you here. Look, water goes in, light, light provides the energy. This is happening where? In the thylakoid. And the result is oxygen gas released as a waste product and then energy molecules that are gonna go on to do other things that we'll learn about later. All right, so this is the next video. We are zoomed in, in this video, we're basically zoomed in. I'll show you here. We are zoomed, you see where this light and water arrows are pointing to this like membrane of the thylakoid, the darker part of the thylakoid, right? So the outer part of the thylakoid right here. That's where we're going to begin in the next video is zoomed into right there. And there will, there will be some things in that, in that mem membrane that are allowing uh, these processes to occur. We'll talk about it here. In most photosynthetic organisms, thylakoids contain pairs of photosystems called photosystem one and photosystem two that work in tandem to produce the energy that will later be used in the stroma to manufacture sugars. The photosystems of the thylakoid consist of a network of accessory pigment. So just to pause it real quick, those little things you see flying down, those are sunlight particles, those are photons. And so those little things you see falling are gonna hit these structures in the membrane of the thylakoid and allow water to be split. So I'll see if I could reverse a little bit here. In the stroma to manufacture sugars. The photosystems of the thylakoid consist of a network of accessory pigment molecules and chlorophyll, the molecules that absorb the photons of light. Within the pigment molecules, the absorbed light energy excites electrons to a higher state. Photosystems will channel the excitation energy gathered by the pigment molecules to a reaction center chlorophyll molecule, which will then pass the electrons to a series of proteins located on the thylakoid membrane. Photons of light strike photosystems one and two simultaneously. We will examine what happens with the photons striking photosystem two first. The energized electrons are passed from the reaction center of photosystem two to an electron transport chain. The elect- You don't need to know the details here. You don't need to know about electric, electron trans, transport chain. You don't know how, need to know about the B complex that's coming up. I'm just showing you this so you can visualize how plants are doing this, okay? I, I'll highlight what you need to know. Electrons lost by photosystem two are replaced by a process called photolysis, which involves the oxidation of a water molecule producing free electrons and oxygen gas. While this oxygen gas is a byproduct of photosynthesis, it is an important input to the cellular respiration pathways. So the point I'm, this is what I'm trying to show you here, that photosystem two, that's full of chlorophyll. 
the green pigment. And the sun particles, the photons are hitting it. They're hitting that photosystem. And when that happens, if a water molecule happens to touch that photosystem, the energy from that photon hitting the photosystem too will cause the water molecule to break up. And hence, that's how oxygen gets released as a byproduct. As electrons pass through the electron transport chain, the energy from the electron is used to pump hydrogen ions from the stroma to the thylakoid, creating a concentration gradient. This gradient powers a protein called ATP synthase, which phosphorylates ADP to form ATP. The low energy electrons leaving photosystem two are shuttled to photosystem one. Within photosystem one, low energy electrons are re-energized and are passed through an electron transport chain where they are used to reduce the electron carrier NADP plus to NADPH. So do you see how that little, so that little motor thing is spinning and those little sparkly ATPs are flying away. So those ATPs are gonna be used, those are energy molecules and those are going to be used to do things that require energy. For example, um, growing, things like that. And that NADPH is gonna be doing that same thing. So those are energy molecules. Uh, and I, so just so you can see how this is all connected. Okay, so that's how oxygen gets released from the water. And then oxygen will leave through the stoma of the stomatal apparatus into the air, right? And then ultimately get breathed in by organisms like us. Next though, um, so we split up H2O, right? And the O left, but we still have H. H is still inside the plant. Of the hydrogen. And so the hydrogen is going to get combined with the carbon dioxide. And that's how we're going to end up with sugars, uh, AKA carbohydrates, but sugars. And that's what this is gonna show you. When the chloroplast is receiving a steady supply of photons, NADPH and ATP molecules are rapidly being provided to the metabolic pathway. Whoops, sorry. Yeah, so those, those ATP and NADPHs are those energy molecules. When the chloroplast is receiving a steady supply of photons, NADPH and ATP molecules are rapidly being provided to the metabolic pathways in the stroma. Therefore, the ATP and NADPH formed during the light-dependent reactions are used in the stroma to fuel the Calvin cycle reactions. The Calvin cycle consists of a series of reactions that reduce carbon dioxide to produce the carbohydrate glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. The Ugh. Why did I keep doing So you don't need to know all the steps of that cycle. I'll, I'm going to try to pause it while I'm doing this here. Let's see if I can do this. When the chloroplast nope. is yeah, receiving here, a steady Calvin cycle consists of a series of reactions that reduce carbon dioxide to produce the carbohydrate glyceraldehyde 3 phosphate. The cycle consists of three steps, the first of which is carbon fixation. In this step, carbon dioxide is attached to ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate, resulting in a six-carbon molecule that splits into two three-carbon molecules. The second step is a sequence of reactions using electrons from NADPH and some of the ATP to reduce carbon dioxide. In the final step, ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate is regenerated. For every three turns of the cycle, five molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate are used to reform three molecules of ribulose 1,5-bisphosphate. The remaining glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate 
is then used to make glucose, fatty right. acids, or glycerol. It takes two molecules of glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate to make one molecule of glucose phosphate. Thus, the Calvin cycle has to run six times to produce one molecule of glucose. These molecules can remove their phosphate and add fructose to form sucrose, the molecule plants use to transport carbohydrates throughout their system. Glucose phosphate is also the starting molecule for the synthesis of starch and cellulose. Right. So obviously, you don't need to know all of those chemical names, but it's important that you see, if I, if I just tell you, you know, carbon dioxide is absorbed and then plants turn it into sugar, you're like, okay. But I'm just wanting you to see that, that there are all of these processes going on that, that allow this to occur, right? But obviously, you don't need to know all the names of those chemical things. When the oh gosh, oh gosh, sorry. Um, okay, so that was the thylakoid associated reactions. And then that last video was the stroma associated reactions, AKA the Calvin cycle. And so what went into that? Notice the color coding here, right? What went into that stroma associated reaction? CO2 gas, those energy molecules made during the thylakoid associated reactions. and uh, hydrogen, which was left over from splitting water, goes through those stroma-associated reactions, and the result eventually, after all those things were whirring around in that that big chemical nightmare <laughs> for you guys, is glucose, glucose, right? And so this is a just to show that exact same thing that was shown in the video, but a little bit more clearly, putting the two things together, right? On the left here, you have the Stroma, sorry, thylakoid associated reactions, which AKA the light reactions, which they made oxygen as a byproduct and these energy molecules. Those energy molecules are gonna go into the Calvin cycle. We don't call them the dark reactions anymore. We used to think that they only happened in the dark, but we're, they do occur when light is available as well. So that's why we don't call that anymore. The energy molecules made from the thylakoid associated reactions are going to go into the Calvin cycle. CO2 gas is going to go through a bunch of stuff with these energy molecules and the result, the result will be glucose, which can be used to make starch, amino acids, fatty acids, and sucrose, right? Okay. Your book also talks about this as well. So you, this may be a time where it'd be useful to go to your book if some of this stuff is feeling a little too um, minimal. That's why you have the book. So here's putting it all together, right? Here's putting it all together. We had the thylakoid associated reactions shown here outlined in orange, and we had the stroma associated reactions, AKA the Calvin cycle outlined here in pink. And if we put those together, we put those two things together, here is the final result. CO2 plus water plus the energy from the sun results in oxygen and glucose. So these are the, the reactants that went into the process of photosynthesis and these are the products that came out. This is the same thing that we see up here, same exact thing. Just down here, they added light. So that's what I want you guys to know. I want you guys to know this formula. Okay. But it was important for you guys to see how we get there. It's not just magic, right? <laughs> There's processes. Okay, the photosynth photosynthesis occurs and we end up with sugars, right? AKA carbohydrates that now will leave the stem, sorry, leave the leaf, leave the leaf. They'll leave the leaf. <laughs> They'll leave the leaf and, uh, and head down to the other parts of the plant, right? So the uh, red 
thing, the red arrows on this slide are showing you carbohydrates, right? They can moving all over the plant uh, to provide sugars, which are needed to do metabolic processes in plants. And the water was moving in the xylem. Where are the carbohydrates moving? In tissue called the phloem, right? Yes. There's a little recall down there, right? Water travels through the xylem tissue. And the carbohydrates and sugars travel through the phloem tissue. All right. Respiration. This is what I was talking about before we were looking at that horse. <laughs> this says, if you can't see it because my head's in the way, respiration, the release of energy from breaking glucose molecules into carbon dioxide. So you know how you, when we exhale, right? When we breathe out, we're releasing carbon dioxide. The reason we do that is because as our body is using energy, like we eat food to have energy, and we use that energy to move and pump our heart and, um, you know, think and sleep and digest and all those things. And when all those cellular activities are happening, the waste product is carbon dioxide, which is why we breathe that out. We don't need carbon dioxide. We breathe it out. It's a waste product for us. Um, the reason is we're... We do, so there's two types, aerobic respiration and anaerobic respiration. Be, aerobic just refers to organisms that breathe oxygen. And that's the only ones we're going to focus on for this course um, is aerobic respiration. So aerobic respiration means oxygen is present, right? For us, that makes sense because uh, oxygen present inside. And if this occurs in all plant cells, it also occurs in all the cells of organisms that breathe oxygen like us and this horse, right? That's why they were showing you the horse from before. I watch a little bit of video of this. Again, there's probably stuff in here you don't need to know, uh, but I'll talk about afterward what is important. In summary, we have seen how the four stages of cellular respiration are responsible for converting the energy found in the glucose molecule into ATP, the energy battery of the cell. On average, 36 ATP molecules are produced per glucose molecule that entered the cell. In the process of producing ATP, oxygen is brought in from the bloodstream to be the final electron acceptor in the electron transport chain, and the carbon dioxide that is produced as a byproduct is released. The goal of cellular respiration is to transfer the energy from the food that we eat daily into ATP that our bodies can use. This process starts with the eating of a snack or meal and ends with capturing the energy from the complete breakdown of the nutrients into energy and carbon dioxide. Right. Right, so, so what I want you to take from that is that, exactly that, think about you eating an apple, right? You eat an apple, the apple has sugars in it that the plant made. Now those sugars are inside of your body. You're breathing in oxygen. Now the oxygen is inside of your body. That's going to allow your body to make energy. And when your body makes energy from those things, it's going to release as waste carbon dioxide and water. And it will use the energy to do things like pump a heart or walk, right? Or grow skin or um, blink, right? <laughs> that takes energy. That doesn't just happen. That, that you need energy to have something like that happen, okay? So this is kind of cool. So, this, so these are the two formulas that I want you guys to know. This formula and this formula. These are the two formulas I want you to know. Cellular respiration, net formula, and the net photosynthesis formula. Um, you might be thinking, wow, that's, that's too much. Two, two whole formulas, that's too much for me to wrap my head around. Well, one thing that's kind of nice is check out, look at what happens when photosynthesis is done. What do you end up with? You end up with oxygen, and you end up with glucose. What goes into 
cellular respiration, oxygen and glucose. So it's the same, what, what is made by photosynthesis is then the thing that goes into cellular respiration. And likewise, look at what comes out of cellular respiration shown in this gray box, carbon dioxide, water, and energy. And uh, what goes into photosynthesis? Carbon dioxide and water and a different type of energy, energy from the sun, but still energy. So that could help you remember this. All right, the hormones and their interaction. I'm gonna pause briefly here to refresh my tea. So let me, I have to stop sharing and then I'll pause and I'll be right back. Okay, tea refreshed, ready to go. Um, so we're getting toward the end of this lecture. Yeah, so that's nice. But just a few more things to talk about. Uh, and they're kind of cool. So let me pull this big. Okay, great. Um, so plant hormones and their interaction. So what is a hormone? We have hormones too inside of our bodies. Hormones are a substance that's produced in one part of an organism and then transported to another part of the organism where it controls or affects growth and development. I believe this is the definition from your textbook. And so in terms of plant hormones, there's there's what's known as the big five <laughs> of the main plant hormones. There's auxins, gibberellins, that's how you say that, gibberellins, cytokinins, abscisic acid, which I'm sure to mess up some point today. <laughs> it's hard for me to say that. Uh, whoops, and that's a typo. That should say ethylene, not ethylene. So it should say, uh, actually, I can just fix it right here. Ethylene, that's what that should say. Ethylene. And we're gonna talk briefly about uh, most of these today. So here's what those formulas look like. If you have ever had to take organic chemistry, these diagrams will look very familiar to you. I'm guessing you haven't had to take that, so you're lucky. Um, but yeah, so these are what, these are how we can represent these different hormones. We're only gonna talk in detail about three of them though, of these five. So first we'll talk about auxin. Auxin was the first plant hormone to ever be discovered. And it was discovered in 1926. And it's produced in a lot of different parts of the plant, including those apical meristems, which you guys are super familiar with at this point, uh, in buds, and then in the young parts of plants. So for example, at root, uh, young roots and like new leaves and things like that. And what do auxins do? When auxins are present, they promote or uh, cause uh, things like cell enlargement and stem growth, cell division, they initiate roots and they do cell differentiation. You don't need to know what that really is. Uh, so in terms of cell enlargement and stem growth, look here, this is the tip of a seedling, okay? Like the shoot of a seedling with the apical meristem at the tip. And look at where light is pointing on this plant, right? So we said that auxin is produced by apical meristems, right? Which on this would be here, right? That's where that apical meristem would be. And we have light shining on this seedling from this direction. And plants need light. We just went through photosynthesis, right? So we know why they need light now. Um, so they want to grow towards light. If you've ever had a plant in a window, you may have noticed this before, right? That it kind of bends toward the light because it needs it for photosynthesis. Well, auxin causes cell enlargement and stem growth because what, what happens is auxin will actually move to the opposite side of a plant, uh, move to where the dark side is of the plant, right? Because the light is coming from the other direction. And when it does that, it tells that side, dark side of that stem to grow more. And over time, that results in the stem bending because it's growing more on, on this side than it is on the uh, 
side exposed to the light. That's due to auxin. Another thing that auxin is, does is it promotes root initiation. So here are two cuttings of a, uh, so like this would have been a bush that somebody would have cut off some parts of that bush. And if you expose the tips of those cuttings um, to auxin, the plant hormone auxin, uh, look here. This one on the left has been given auxin or exposed to auxin hormone, whereas this one on the right has not been. And so you could see here, auxin promotes root initiation and the one on the left has a lot more roots. So this is useful in agriculture. You can like make many plants out of a single plant um, by just taking cuttings of the plant. Okay. Oh, and then, so we, we just talked about things that auxin promotes, but auxin also causes certain things to be delayed or inhibited, which means kind of like stopped or, or paused. Um, so auxin will delay or inhibit leaf and fruit fall. So like in the autumn where leaves want to fall, auxin helps regulate when that occurs. So let's say there's like one cold day or something. You don't want to lose all your leaves if it's going to be 80 degrees again for the next week. So auxin will, will kind of be able to help regulate the correct time for leaves to fall off and for fruit to fall off. Let's say your fruit isn't ripe yet, doesn't have ripe seeds in it yet. You, then you don't want to have it fall off of the plant because the seeds may never ripen um, depending on what species you're talking about. Uh, another thing that auxin helps delay or, or prevent is fruit ripening and lateral branching. So we're gonna talk first about this leaf and fruit fall. Um, so for example, here you see on the left, the auxin is going to the, where the leaf is attached to the stem and getting into high concentrations there. And when that happens, the leaf will not fall off. But if auxin stops being produced and stops being, see how they made a line here as versus here is like, it's going to this part by the stem. Here, it's not going anymore. Right here, it's stopped. Once auxin stops telling the stem, oh, sorry, it doesn't tell it, hey, stem, no. Once the auxin stops going towards that location in the stem, uh, then other processes occur and then eventually the leaf will, will fall off, right? See, it triggers the shedding phase. See? Um, yes, so if auxin does go here, it tells the leaf don't fall off yet. But it, once that stops, then the leaf will fall off. Okay. Oop. Uh, another thing auxin, Lays or inhibits is something called lateral branching. So we already learned around the, about the apical meristem. So a lot of in a lot of plants, because the apical meristem is where auxin is made. So here is an apical meristem, and auxin prevents lateral branching. The apical meristem is making a bunch of auxin. You won't have branching. So like this is what the plant might look like, right? kind of tall, but not very bushy or anything like that. However, if you remove the tip and of the plant or remove the apical meristem from the plant, auxin stops being produced and thus lateral branching can occur. So whereas here on the left, we really only have one main branch. Here on the right, we got a lot of lateral branches occurring. And that's because the apical meristem that makes auxin was removed and then the lateral buds will take over. Um, see, producing bushier plants. So oftentimes if you have, if you're doing landscape work on your house or you might even have a house plant that's kind of like long and spindly, people tend to like plants that are more bushy. And so this is one way you could actually get them to be that way make them more bushy. 
All right, so that was oxen. Now we'll talk about gibberellin. And then we'll only talk about one more after that. And then we'll talk about plant movement and then we'll be done. <laughs> so gibberellins were discovered in the 50s and now there's over a hundred of them known. They're produced by immature seeds, the root and the shoot tips, young leaves, and some fungi also produce gibberellins. Gibberellins promote growth and stem length. They promote flowering. They uh, make buds open and they make seeds uh, not germinate, or that's why it says seed dormancy. So like it makes them kind of hold off on germinating and they allow plants to grow in colder temperatures as well. So just to be clear, Oxins are made, oxins and gibberellins, these are plant hormones. So these are hormones that the plants make themselves, that they naturally make. So gibberellins produce, sorry, promote growth rate and stem length. So look here on the right, there's three plants there that have been treated with plant hormone gibberellins. And look at how long the stems are of those <laughs> cabbages. Where is, and this, this photo is a little, like hilarious, whatever. <laughs> um, and then on the left is cabbages that were not treated with gibberellins, those two on the bottom. All right, that's all, that's all I want you to know about gibberellins. I think I get creeped out by the photo. Um, all right, so ethylene. Ethylene is cool. Ethylene is also made by plants. Um, it was first discovered in 1901. Uh, it has a cool formula and that it's CH2, CH2. So it's kind of neat. It's produced in a lot of different parts of plants, fruits, flowers, seeds, leaves, and roots. And ethylene, so whereas gibberellins, sorry, whereas auxins prevent fruit ripening, ethylene promotes fruit ripening and promotes flower aging and promotes leaves falling off. So it's kind of like all the opposite things that auxin does. Uh, ethylene is usually released as a gas to the plants. So here we have um, on the left is a plant, this is from your book, a plant that is, I guess, how it looked when they first put it in there. Oh, sorry, the one on the left is by itself. And then one on the right, they have put an apple in with it. And the ethylene gas released by that apple caused the leaves to fall off of the stick, right? Because a uh, leaf drop is something that ethylene gas promotes, right? So that's what this is showing you here. Another thing is that certain fruits will only ripen if they're exposed to ethylene gas by the plant. So these include tomato, apple, banana, mango, peach, pears, avocado, and melons. Then there's other fruits that will ripen without ethylene gas present, such as citrus fruits, grapes, watermelons, and strawberries. People have taken advantage of this fact. Um, so for example, let's say that I just got a whole bunch of, um, I, I'm selling bananas and I know that if ethylene gas is present, it's going to cause my bananas to get ripe very, very fast, but maybe my bananas need to go from South America to North America, or maybe they need to go from Asia to Europe or something like that, right? Maybe they have to travel a far distance and you don't want them to get all ripe before they arrive. So what you can do, one thing that uh, the industry does is they put these little tablets, they're like little packets, kind of like the packets that you get. Like if you buy a new pair of shoes, there's like the little packet of silicone silica to absorb moisture. It's kind of like that idea, but instead it absorbs the ethylene gas made by the bananas. And if the ethylene gas gets absorbed into those little packets, you prevent them from ripening. So like you see here, this is bananas with ethylene gas absorber and look at what they look like one week later as versus bananas without having the ethylene gas removed and they're, therefore they get ripe very, very fast. So to be clear, it's the bananas that are producing the ethylene gas. <laughs> they're making it themselves. 
Um, if it accumulates around them though, because ethylene gas promotes ripening, the bananas will get ripe. So using the packets allows you to transport them a little longer without them getting ripe right away, right? Okay. Um, you may have noticed before, you maybe you bought a pear um, or another fruit that was wrapped individually in like a paper. Like sometimes, a lot of times pears are the ones I've seen that are wrapped in a paper. This is to help them get ripe. So they would have been, um, when they were sent in a truck or something, pears bruise very easily. So they probably would have been using something to remove the ethylene gas released by the pears away from the pears so that they don't get ripe. But then once you get them to the store, you want them to get riper. And so one way they do that is by um, wrapping them in a paper which will trap the gas that they make near them and cause them to get riper faster. Okay, so that's all. Auxins, gibberellins, ethylenes are the three plant horms, uh, hormones I want you guys to know about. And now we're gonna just see some examples of plant movement and we'll be done for today. So we already know plants move because they grow, plants grow. And in a lot of the videos we've looked at of the plants growing from a seed, sometimes the plants kind of moving side to side, sometimes the leaves are kind of moving up and down. And those are actual types of movements plants do and that have names. Um, so some of those plant movements occur because of things going on inside of the plant, or we could say internal stimuli, chemical things going on in the plant. So one type of movement that's the result of chemical things going on inside of the plant is what's called nutations or spiraling movement. And so I'm going to stop sharing this and let me pull this up here. And let me go back here and share this. Uh, and we don't need sound for these. So this is an example of that movement called nutations, which is a spiraling. And so what it really is, is the plant is growing. And in this case, this is a type of vine. And so it will need to latch on to something to grow, grow taller. And so it does this um, kind of spiraling movement as it's growing to reach out to find something to grip onto. I'm getting, I'm making myself dizzy that I'm doing that. And that's, that movement is called nutations. Um, see, and then they finally found their, what they're looking for and now they can grow up it because that's what vines need to do. All right, that's that one. I'm gonna stop sharing here. The next one we're gonna look at is something called nodding movement. This is another one that is the result of um, internal stimuli. Okay, so this here showing you these so-called nodding movements, like how you nod your head to say yes, like yes. And so you could see, look, here's a pea plant that's emerging from the soil. You see how it's kind of doing that nodding movement? These are other types of plant, but yeah, you're, yeah, you always think plants don't move, right? They, they move, you just have to use a camera. <laughs> And now you can see the top of that P is kind of doing that mutation spiraling thing, right? Yeah. That's that nodding movement. Okay. Um, the next type of movement we're going to look at is what's called twining movements. Twining movements, I'll show you the word in a second. Let me share this with you guys first. Here we go. Okay. So 
So this is twining movements are what plants do that make a thing called a tendril. Um, you'll see you you'll see what we're talking about in a second. So this is that right there is still doing that nutation thing where it's kind of spiraling around looking for something to grip onto. Once it grips onto this rod, it will start to do those twining movements. So here you go. It's, it's kind of like, is that safe for me to grip? There you go. There's the twining movement. That little uh, lasso almost. Super cool. See that? That's twining. when it makes that little coil. Mm -hmm. And then you see this, this is the twining movement. Pretty crazy, right? Yeah, so the little coil thing is the twining movement. Eventually it gets even more coiled. Okay. And then, all right, okay, yeah. So I should stop sharing that. And share this. Uh, yeah, so the nutations were those kind of spiraling movements where the plant's looking for something to grab onto. Nodding movements are more like how the plant moves as it's getting taller. Twining movements were those little kind of Spot, uh, curly Q things that it uses to kind of grip onto something. And those are all examples of internal uh, movements brought about by internal stimuli. So there's stuff happening inside the plant that's causing those types of movements. Then there are types of plant movements that are a result of external stimuli. So something is affecting the plant from the outside and causing the plant to move in a certain way. And we're gonna talk about two different types of this movement phototropism and gravitropism. Phototropism is movement toward light. Gravitropism is movement towards, uh, in response to gravity. So I'll pull these up. And gotta go back here. And let me share this. So first we'll see phototropism. And so all plants pretty much want to move towards light, right? Or, or be exposed to light. And so what this video is gonna show you is they're gonna grow these little plants. And, and during the course of the, the plants growing, they're gonna move the light. There's a lamp that they're using and they're gonna move it to show you how the plants switch directions to go towards the light. So here the plants are starting to grow. The light is originally coming from the left and you can see how the plants are stretching to go toward, and then they move the, the lamp and you can see how many hours is passing as they do this. Look, hour 50 and then they move the lamp. So it only takes a few hours for them to reorient themselves. I have plants here in my apartment that I have to move quite a bit because they otherwise they'll be all one-sided uh, so that was phototropism or movement toward light and now we're going to look at gravitropism um don't worry about negative and positive just know that oh i guess the reason okay 
So the reason why that, that video said positive phototropism is because the plants want to move towards light in the, like, so toward the light. However, plants don't want to, the shoots of plants don't want to grow toward gravity. They want to go, grow away from gravity, hence negative gravitropism. All I care about is that you know phototropism is when plants are trying to grow toward the light and gravitropism is when plants are grow, trying to grow away from gravity, right? So look at this. So these are plants, uh, bean plants that are just being grown normally. And then they take one of the pots and they put it on its side. And you can see how the shoots of those plants wants to be growing away from the earth and thus they will respond accordingly by growing against gravity. And all of this growth is all dictated by auxin. So in the case of phototropism and gravitropism, in both cases, it's because of auxin. Um, I should mention roots on the other hand, don't want to grow toward the light. And roots on the other hand, want to grow toward the earth. So roots will grow away from light and roots will grow towards gravity. But the shoots grow toward light and the shoots grow away from gravity. Okay, I think that's it. Let me pull this up. I think it is. I think it is. Yes, so that is it for lecture five. There's a quiz available now on Canvas that's due by on Friday by midnight. And next class is lecture exam one, which covers material from lectures one through five. There is a study guide available on Canvas for you. I mentioned last time, please look it over, use it to guide you. Um, if you have any questions about anything, feel free to email me. Hopefully you guys have been writing in the, um, in the threads beneath the lecture slides uh, for participation. And uh, with that, I will see you guys next time. Next time, so for the exam, uh, we won't meet face-to-face -face on the exam day. Uh, you will just take the exam on Canvas and the exam will be available starting at 6 p.m. that evening. Um, yeah, if you have any questions about it, feel free to email me. All right, take care, have a good week.